welcome to church. Glad you could join us. Let's sing praises to our God.
Well, welcome to church again today. It's great to have you with us. I've just got a few announcements for us now. And first and foremost, I'd like to announce a special members meeting, which is coming up on the 28th of June. That will be at 1.30 p.m. It will, of course, be an online meeting as we're still in the restrictions with COVID-19. Uh, login details and the specifics of the meeting would have actually been emailed to you. So if you haven't received that, please contact the office. And I'm sure Peter will get on to that. But uh, that email contains the fact that there's only two agenda items those agenda items being uh, the new budget as well as the reappointment of an elder. So uh, please make sure you uh, have a look through all that information and be prepared for the meeting on the 28th of June and have a look at those login details. If you've got any questions at all, please contact us and we'll make sure that we help you out as much as we can to make that happen. Uh, please also be praying for Pastor David and uh, Rosemary as they're on leave at the moment, uh, just that that will be a great time of refreshment and relaxation and he'll be recharged and revitalised when he returns to ministry soon. Uh, thank you so much too for continuing to connect with each other. We ask that you do make sure you do keep doing that and especially as we begin to have ministries uh, come back to physically meeting, uh, it's important that we don't miss out uh, on contacting anyone and letting them know what is actually happening but continue to connect with each other connect with each other. That's, that's been a great encouragement for us to see so many people doing that. Uh, also, we want to thank you again for your giving and we ask that you continue to prayerfully consider uh, what you were giving to the church and the work here and that you do uh, continue to do that and uh, also look at the ways that that can happen. Again, if you've got any questions about uh, giving uh, electronically, please contact the church office and they'll be more than willing to help. The other, only other thing that I want to mention is the fact that there's a number of groups that are coming back to meet in the church. Uh, there are a number of things that have to happen, not just the fact that it's 20 or below that are permitted to meet only one group on a property at a time, but there's a number of other things that have to occur as well. For this reason, we ask that you contact Peter, that any bookings for the property be made through Peter alone and that you contact the church office so that they can provide you with those details and let you know who is on the property or when the property is actually available because we can only have one group here at a time and at this stage only up to 20 people. Well that's about all to, for today. I hope you enjoyed the service so far and that you continue to do so. Let's be praying and connecting with each other during the week. Hi guys, Pastor Bren bringing another Kids Church message. Delighted to be with you guys again. And thanks again so much, kids, for sending in all the craft and the drawings that you do during this time. Uh, we really appreciate that. And I look forward to having a big old montage of that to put together later on. Uh, but this week, we're going to continue in our story as we carry on through the Gospel of Luke. And now Jesus has been born. We've had the Christmas story. And today we're looking at the story of what happens when Jesus gets taken to the temple to be dedicated and how the people react to seeing the child savior there for the first time. Now you might have noticed that we take babies to church so that parents can thank God for them and ask him to care for them and dedicate them to him. So this is what happened when Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple when he was a young baby to be dedicated to God. When baby Jesus was eight days old, Joseph and Mary took him to the temple in Jerusalem to dedicate his life to God, just as was written and commanded to them in the law that God gave to Moses. And at the temple in Jerusalem was a man of God called Simeon, who was 84 years old. The Spirit of God had promised that he would be alive to see the Savior God was sending in the world. Simeon prayed and he waited for many years, and now he was a very old man. And when Simeon saw baby Jesus, God's Holy Spirit told him that this baby was the promised one. This baby was the savior that he had been waiting to see. And he asked Joseph and Mary if he could hold the baby. And then Simeon's heart was filled with joy and he thanked God and he praised God that his prayers had been answered and that God had been good to him. Lord, he said, now I can die in peace. For I have seen the Savior that you have given the world, just as you promised me that I would. He is the light that will shine upon the nations of Gentiles. He will be the glory of your people Israel. Joseph and Mary were amazed to hear these things. Although Simeon told Mary, Many things will happen to your son that will make you very sad. But God knows those who believe and follow him. Anna, a very old widow, was also at the temple, and she had told Joseph and Mary that God's Spirit had shown her that Jesus was the promised Savior too. Anna was from the tribe of Asher, and Mary kept these words from Anna in her heart 
as well. So it's exciting to see that even as a baby, Jesus is causing a stir, and people seem to recognize that he's there to save them. And so there's a couple of things in this story to talk about, but I'm going to focus on one, and that's that Jesus is the savior of everyone. You know, you see in this story that Simeon, this old Jewish man, had been waiting for so long to see the savior of God's people. And when he comes, he holds this baby in his arms, and he says, this is the light to the Gentiles and the savior of God's people. He recognizes that Jesus is the savior of both the people called the Jews, who God had been with all this time, and also for the Gentiles, the nations, the people like you and me, who weren't part of the Jews, but were still God's people because he made us all, and he loves us all. And then Anna comes in. Anna is this other prophetess. She's this old, uh, old woman who comes along, and she holds Jesus in her arms as well. And she's from the tribe of Asher. Now, you might remember we talked about uh, Daniel before. Uh, the prophet Daniel, and how the people of the uh, of Israel were in exile. They were away in a different nation a long time ago. And you may remember, when we studied Exodus a long, long time ago, the Israelites were composed of 12 tribes. Judah was one of them. And Judah is the tribe that comes back and becomes the Jews. They come back to Jerusalem. But the other tribes, they call them the lost tribes of Israel, because they're still scattered throughout the world. They were broken apart, they never quite came back together, and they felt like God had abandoned them. And Anna is from one of those tribes, she's from Asher. And she sees this child and goes, ah, this is the savior of all of us, and God hasn't abandoned us. And that's a wonderful message. And you know, you and I get to be part of this family of God's people that stretches across time and across all the world and is open to anyone who loves our Lord Jesus. And that's a pretty special blessing. So let's thank God for, the, for that together. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the promise that came with your son Jesus to our world. We thank you that when he died on the cross, even though it broke Mary's heart, even though that it was a, a painful and terrible thing to happen to those who loved him, that the fact that he died for us and that he rose again to show us the way to heaven, that that sets us free. Oh Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we've been set free. That all the people have been if they love your son set free drawn into this family of believers what a wonderful blessing to be a part of god and we have only you to thank and praise with our lives we bless you as you bless us in the name of your son jesus christ amen well, this week i guess we get to see how good people are at drawing old people because Anna's 84 years old and Simeon's 84 years old, and they're both in this story. So I look forward to seeing those crafts and those drawings, and God bless you guys. We'll see you next week. Did you hear the shamisen? Did you enjoy the koto? Maybe there was a bit of uh, uh, taiko in that.
I'm not sure. But anyway, I love the shakuhachi. That's the bamboo flute. I just needed to set the scene, do something Japanese. I don't have my yukata on, and I didn't know whether you'd recognize me. Um, so, hello, church. It's good to be, well, as much as I am here, it's good to be here. Um, I'm glad you're here. Um, there may be somebody here who says, who is this guy? So let me introduce myself, Gary Weston. My wife is Ruth, and we've been OMF church planters in Japan for like 32 years. Um, in 2017, though, we came back for what we thought was going to be a six-month home assignment. Boy, did we get that wrong. In any case, um, that's a long story, but we'd like to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Did you hear me? Because I want to say that again. Thank you. Church, you have been supporting us for like decades, and that's brilliant. That means a lot to us, and that's shown us something of God's faithfulness, and we really, really appreciate that. Um, we've been able to share with our, our prayer letters, and I hope you're getting our prayer letter. If you're not, please contact me, and I'd love to send you our prayer letter. Uh, right now, obviously, we're not in Japan. We're back here in Brisbane, and we're doing what we call Diaspora Returnees Ministry, DRM for short. And what it means is we're reaching out to Japanese who are here in Brisbane. There are 5,000 residents of Brisbane who are Japanese. And then there are stacks and stacks of other Japanese who aren't residents. Think of the backpackers and the businessmen. Think of the tourists and the students. So anyway, we have a whole mission field right here. Pray for us that we'll be able to reach them. And uh, one answer to prayer, you've been praying for a long time because we've gone through a really difficult time. I mean, like I couldn't believe um, for a couple of years since we've gotten back uh, to do with Ruth's health. And now Ruth has got medical clearance. Did I hear you say hallelujah? I'm certainly saying hallelujah. It's great news. Um, I wish it was just as clear cut as that. Um, it's not like watertight compartments, like now she's got medical clearance and we're gonna take off. Well, I mean, we, we've gotta do it gradually and there's always mm, the risk of relapse and uh, it, it's a bit scary each step. We're taking steps of faith, but Ruth is so much better, so thank you for praying. Continue to pray for us. Um, yeah, and so we need your prayers to be reaching out to the Japanese. Every fortnight we have what we call Japanese House of Peace. And whereas before, when we were not online, when we were meeting face to face, we could only meet with the people who were local. Now we can meet with Japanese people all over the world. It's great. Anyway. Church, thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Bye. Let's just join together and pray. Father God, I thank you once more that we can meet like this. I thank you that you've provided us the potential and possibility to do this online. I thank you for all the people who are involved in making these services happen. I pray that your hand will be upon them. I pray your blessings will be with them. And I pray that they'll be strengthened and encouraged as they continue to do this for quite some time for us. Lord, I pray for all of those groups who are looking at coming back and meeting together physically. I just pray, Lord, that this will be a great time of excitement and celebration for them and that we as a people will be able to facilitate that as much as possible. And that, Lord, we will be thank very thankful to you for all that you've done for us, the way you've grown us. And, Lord, that we'll appreciate uh, just how incredible it is to be able to meet together once more. Thank you that so many people are already doing this through their connect groups. Father, I want to pray for a number of our young people who are facing assessments and exams and uh, the pressures that they're facing in the midst of that with online study rather than face-to-face. -face. We just ask, Lord, that you'll reward them um, for the study and the effort that they've put in, that, Father, they, they will bring to mind the things that they need to in order to be able to complete their assessments. 
Father, we want to pray for so many of our people within our um, family at SDBC that your hand will be upon them as they look at relaunching their businesses, as they look at connecting again uh, with the public. Uh, we ask, Lord, that that will be a seamless transition for them and, Lord, uh, that income will begin to flow for them again and that, Father, uh, they'll be able to overcome any uh, hurdles or uh, potential uh, troubles that they may face and that you, again, will bless them and bless their business as they serve our communities. More than anything, Lord, I pray for us as a people that you help us to be aware of the chances and opportunities that you present to us each and every day. Let us be a people who look for divine appointments, Lord. Let us be willing to step out in faith for you, Lord, and to encourage those around us to look into the truth of the gospel. Father, as we come back to meet as a people, help us to invite our friends, our family, our neighbours along to meetings where they can hear about you and the incredible things that you've done for us. Father, I want to thank you again for the income so many of us have and how well we live in the Western world that we're in. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we can give back a very small portion of what you've blessed us with. I ask that we will give generously, but that we'll give cheerfully, Lord, that this will not be a burden to any of us and that we'll honour and glorify you through what we are willing to give. So, Father, for these gifts, we ask that uh, you will use them to further your kingdom on this earth. Uh, as they go to the mission field, as they support this building, Lord, as they support the church, and that we'll see more brought into your kingdom as a result. We pray this now, Father, in Jesus' name, and for his sake. Amen. Bless you, one and all. Thank you.
church my name is Dirk and I'll be bringing you the Bible reading today the Bible reading is Zephaniah chapter 3 and I'll be reading from the NIV woe to the city of oppressors rebellious and defiled she obeys no one she accepts no correction she does not trust in the Lord she does not draw near to her God her officials within her are roaring lions her rulers are evening wolves who leave nothing for the morning her prophets are unprincipled they are treacherous people. Her priests profane the sanctuary and do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no wrong. Morning by morning he dispenses his justice, and every morning he does not fail. Yet the unrighteous know no shame. I have destroyed nations. Their strongholds are demolished. I have left their streets deserted, with no one passing through. Their cities are laid waste. They are deserted and empty. Of Jerusalem I thought, surely you will fear me and accept correction. Then her place of refuge will not be destroyed, nor all my punishments come upon her. But they were still eager to act corruptly in all they did. Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day I will stand up to testify. I have decided to assemble the nations to gather the kingdoms and pour out my wrath on them all my fierce anger the whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger then i will purify the lips of the peoples that all of them may call on the name of the lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder from beyond the rivers of cush my worshippers my scattered people will bring me offerings on that day you jerusalem will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me, because I will remove from you your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong, they will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down and no one will make them afraid. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment, and he has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves, he will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, 
which is a burden and a reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the book of the prophet Zephaniah. We're looking at this morning, Zephaniah. His name means hidden one. Zephan, hidden, Yah, Yahweh. Yahweh is hidden or Yahweh hides. Talk about that in just a moment. Um, We're going to read a little bit of uh, Zephaniah this morning and work our way through the book. It's a very strong, very simple, but very clear and challenging book. So I invite you to pray with me and then we shall jump into this part of God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we want to thank you that we have the opportunity to gather together, to open your word and to listen to it read and explained. And we ask that you might help us to understand the message and how it applies to our life and to our world. We thank you for the blessing of your word and ask that we might never take it for granted, but that we might be in submission to it and live lives that are obedient to it. To your honour and glory, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So Zephaniah, if you turn in your Bibles to the book, let me read to you just the beginning, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, during the reign of Josiah, king of, king, uh, son of Ammon, king of Judah. <clears throat> Zephaniah is the only of one of the minor prophets who gives us such an extensive genealogy. He gives us four generations. And I think the significance of that is that it goes back all the way to a person called Hezekiah. And we think that is going to be King Hezekiah. And if that's the case, then that makes Zephaniah of royal blood, makes him a prince to the king. And while he prophesied during the reign of a good king, Josiah, he would have been related to him and perhaps had access. And probably Josiah was influenced by the preaching and teaching of Zephaniah. So he has royalty in his blood. Hezekiah was a good king. Um, but Hezekiah is the, the king, you might remember the story, where he asked for an extension of uh, his life and God gave him an extra 15 years. And the 15 years weren't used very well. During that time, visitors came from Babylon and uh, things were done and said that shouldn't have been done and promised. And, and then Hezekiah dies and he's followed by an absolutely terrible king, one of the worst, Manasseh, his son. And Manasseh took Israel, Judah, back, back to idol worship, reinstituted um, altars throughout the land and even reintroduced Molech, which is sacrificing children to this false god. They were into the fertility cults and astrology and Manasseh was instrumental in that. In fact, the book of two chronicles tells us that Manasseh had led Judah to be worse behaved than even the Canaanites before Israel came into the promised land and God had removed them. And now here was God's own people who were misbehaving terribly. Isaiah lived during the time of Manasseh. And in fact, Manasseh was so bad, he forbade Isaiah from preaching and teaching. So Isaiah took to writing and he wrote his prophecy that we have today, which is a magnificent book. But he was opposed by Manasseh and eventually Manasseh arrested him, bound him, put him inside of a tree trunk and then had somebody saw the tree trunk in half. Book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 37 refers to that, that it's referring to the death of Isaiah the prophet who died in that manner. So Manasseh was a terrible king, reigned for 55 years, had such a bad influence on the people of Judah. And then when he passed away, he was succeeded by his son, Ammon, who was a weak king and only reigned for a very short time, two years. And then he was assassinated. And then the next king was Josiah. That's the king that Zephaniah names in verse 1. 
Now, Josiah, when he became a king, you can read about this in the book of 2 Kings, 22, 23 and following. Uh, he was only eight years old when he became king. Now, it's obviously too young to reign. And so Hilkiah, who was the high priest, was really the one in charge. And he was leading and discipling and mentoring Josiah until he came of age. And the question was, would this king, Josiah, would he follow the way of his grandfather, Manasseh? Or would he follow the way of his great-great-grandfather, Hezekiah? Well, in his teens, at about the age of 16, Josiah started seeking the Lord. And his heart was inclined towards pleasing God. And then as he became of age and started to assume more of the ruling responsibilities in Jerusalem and Judea, he started instituting change. The temple was in disrepair, so he enabled it to start to be repaired. And in that process, they rediscovered the book of the law the book of Deuteronomy, Josiah read it, read God's word, saw how Judah had gotten off track and he sought to institute reforms to bring them back on track. And in Jerusalem, he removed all of the idol altars and then eventually over the next few years, he extended that into the countryside. But it would appear that the reform was surface level, it was shallow, it didn't penetrate to the heart of the people. They were simply going through the outward motions um, the people's hearts were still inclined to doing their own thing and not submitting and doing God's way. Josiah made a, a foolish, probably ego-driven decision where Egypt was heading north and passing through the land and they wanted to invade Assyria and Josiah didn't give permission to travel through the land and that led to a battle in which he was killed prematurely. His life is taken. And so Zephaniah is speaking into the hearts of Jerusalem and Judah at exactly this sorts of time. The book Zephaniah falls into about two parts. And the two parts follow a similar pattern. He begins with extremely strong language about judgment. We'll look at some of that. But then it ends with this glimmer of hope. What can we do? Well, turn and turn back to God and perhaps he'll have mercy on us. And then again, a second long passage of judgment, this time on the nations. And then that's followed by, again, this element of hope. So judgment, what can we do? There is hope. Judgment, what can we do? And there is a bright future for those of us who turn back to God. So let's turn to the book of Zephaniah. And in the chapter one, in the first part of it, he looks within. He looks within the city of Jerusalem. He looks within the people of Judah. And the language is quite extreme. Um, let's read chapter 1, verse 2. God is speaking. He says, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both man and beast. I'll sweep away the birds of the air, the fish in the sea, and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble. God is going to wipe everything out. The language is strong. It's about, in our understanding... This is about the end of the world. This is about when Jesus comes back and God removes and establishes a new heavens and a new earth. That's what Zephaniah is speaking into. In verse 3, he continues, When I destroy all mankind on the face of the earth, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will destroy every remnant of the Baal worship in this place and the very names of the idolatrous priests. Those who bow down on the roofs to worship the starry host, those who bow down and swear by the Lord, and who also swear by Moloch. Here is this syncretistic form of worship where God's people, while they would still use God's name, Yahweh, the Lord, would mix that with the names of other gods and other forms of worship. Even on their own rooftops, they have idols and they worship the stars, the starry host, astrology. And things haven't changed too much, have they? If you look at our world and you'll find there are millions of people who still consult the stars, who still look at astrology and believe and hope that the, their future is written in the stars. Why consult the stars when you can consult the star maker, the Lord Jesus himself? The Lord says in verse 7 of chapter 1, Be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. 
The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and he's consecrated those he has invited. Zephaniah doesn't tell us who the guests are, but that's going to be Babylon. And the sacrifice is going to be his own people, Jerusalem and Judah. God is going to wipe them out. Um, but there is a hope of a remnant. But the message is, if you're a disobedient to God and if you're sinning and not living your life aligned with him, he is going to remove you. And Zephaniah mentions this phrase, the day of the Lord. He alludes to it something like 18 times. The day of the Lord is mentioned in the Old Testament and the New Testament about 26 times all up. And 18 of those times are in the book of Zephaniah. It's an emphasis of his message. And the people of Israel had misunderstood. They had a, an incorrect understanding of what was going to happen on that day. They sort of felt that the day of the Lord is when God's going to come, he's going to bless his people and judge the nations. Just like we think that when Jesus comes, he's going to bless his people, us, and he's going to judge and remove the nations. And while that's true, the people of Israel had misunderstood both God's plan and God's purpose. They misunderstood the, the Messiah coming. And so they had this incorrect idea that just because they were physically descended from Abraham, that they were physically Jews, therefore they were safe. It didn't matter what, how they behaved or how they lived or how they worshipped, it's simply because they were physical, physically descendants of Abraham, that therefore they were God's people and they were protected. They could do whatever they like and God would never hurt them. That was their false understanding. And Zephaniah is seeking to correct that. The day of the Lord is not going to be a day when he comes to bless you. It's a day when he is going to come and blast you because you are not aligned with him. That's the picture and that's the analogy he gives. Let's continue in chapter 1 on verse 10. He says, On that day, the day of the Lord, a cry will go up from the fish gate. It's the northern gate of Jerusalem where the fish would come through from the Sea of Galilee or from the Jordan River. A cry will go up from the fish gate, wailing from the new quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, you who live in the market district, all you merchants will be wiped out. All who trade in silver will be destroyed. At that time, I'll search Jerusalem with lamps and I'll punish those who are complacent. God is going to come. He's going to look carefully. He's going to evaluate and he is going to judge. Verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It's, it's near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of cloud and darkness, blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against Jerusalem. So it doesn't sound like it's good news. And that's certainly the message that Zephaniah is trying to communicate to the people of, of uh, Jerusalem. They're in trouble, that they need to listen and they need to repent. God is coming. God's going to intervene. He's going to call an end to all this sort of behavior. If we jump ahead in our Bibles, if you went to the book of Revelation, then when you get to something like the opening of the fourth seal... 25% of the people in the world are killed. When you come to the sixth trumpet, 33% of the people in the world are killed. And then when you get to the seventh bowl, uh, then the islands uh, and the mountains are removed or flattened and there are huge hailstones coming down targeting people. If you read those chapters, that's very similar to the picture and the language of Zephaniah chapter 1. This is the end of the world. This is the removal of the ungodly well what can we do well he tells us at the end of this first part chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 there is something for God's people to do in the midst of this terrible outpouring of God's wrath God encourages his people gather together um, uh, Call an assembly of people together to seek God's face, verse 2, before the decree takes effect and that day passes like windblown chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes on you. Verse 3, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. 
you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility, and perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. It may be, gather together, pray, repent, ask God for mercy and forgiveness. Um, seek righteousness to do justice and to live rightly and be a humble people before God, not proud and arrogant. And Zephaniah says, perhaps God will preserve you from it. Um, it certainly reminds us that when God judges, he does make a distinction. He doesn't just carpet bomb everything. He has a way of preserving his people from his wrath. That's what he did in the land of Egypt with the plagues. Uh, the people of Israel were preserved from those. He did it with the flood. When God wiped out all life on the earth, he preserved his remnant, Noah, in the ark. And in the same way, God will preserve us as we are faithful and obedient to him, as we seek him faithfully, have faith in him and are faithful in our lives. That's a look within. Uh, Zephaniah continues describing this terrible coming wrath and this time on all of the nations. Now he looks around the city of Judah and he looks at in every direction. He looks to the west, he looks to the east, he looks to the south and he looks to the north and he names these different nations and all of them at some point had hassled Judah or Israel, God's people and all of them likewise were corrupt and wicked and all of them will fall. God is the God of the nations. He's the one who has the casting vote. He is the one who determines the boundaries of the nations. He is the one who appoints governments. He is the one who raises up and who puts down. God is in control. And there is coming a day, Zephaniah is predicting, when God will pour out his wrath and his indignation. He'll consume everything, just like the flood. Only this time, it'll be with fire. Just like Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3. Zephaniah is teaching us that God is intensely irritated. His anger is like simmering. It's heading for the boiling over bit, but it's, right now it's simmering. And there is still time to repent. Um, and if they don't listen, if they don't pay heed, then God's anger will continue to grow and it will simply boil over. And the book of Zephaniah is describing for us that boiling over of God's anger, of being poured out. It's certainly true God loves us, cares for us, is jealous for us to be right with him. Uh, but God is also furious with evil, with sin. And he's furious with people who refuse to come to him for mercy and forgiveness. As God looks at our world and all that's going on in our world, then he must likewise have an element of not just disappointment, but of being furious, not being very happy at all about marriages breaking up, about domestic violence, about the abuse of children, about racial discrimination of those who have authority of misusing it and abusing it for their own means of gangs and murders and crimes and all of the evil that is going on in our world, God knows and notices and does not want it, He's cranky about it, furious about it. This balance between God loves us and yet God is angry with the sin of the world is to be held in tension. What can we do? Well, what Zephaniah said in chapter 2, seek God, ask him for mercy, ask him to forgive us, to seek righteousness and to seek humility. And then Zephaniah, having done this, looking around the nations at um, what they had done wrong, then comes back and zeroes in again in chapter 3 upon Jerusalem. Woe to that city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. Verse 2, she, the city of Jerusalem, obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are like roaring lions. Her rulers are evening wolves. They leave nothing for the morning. What does that mean? <clears throat> Zephaniah likens the leaders, particularly of Jerusalem, 
to these ravenous animals, lions and wolves, who eat everything that night. They're not concerned about the morning. They're not concerned about the future. They're concerned about now and satisfying their own whims and their own things. They have no concern for the future or for the next generation. Verse 4, her prophets are unprincipled, they're treacherous people. Her priests profane the sanctuary and do violence to the Lord. The Lord within her is righteous and he does no wrong. Morning by morning he dispenses justice and every new day he doesn't fail. Yet the unrighteous know no shame, forgotten how to blush. They get away with it, they're proud of it and they encourage others in doing it. So what does God say? Verse 6, I have destroyed nations and their strongholds are demolished. I've left their streets completely deserted with no one passing through. Verse 7, Jerusalem, <clears throat> I thought surely you will fear me and you will accept correction. And then her place of refuge would not be destroyed uh, and not all of my punishments would come on, her, come on her. But listen, but they were still eager to act corruptly in all that they did. God told them what to do and they were absolutely eager to not do it, to do their own thing. Therefore, God says, verse 8, Therefore wait for me, for the day I will stand up and I will testify. I have decided to assemble the nations, to gather the kingdoms of the world and I will pour out my wrath on them, all of my fierce anger. The whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. The whole world. Every man, every woman, every child, every nation gathered together before him. The New Testament certainly amplifies that for us and the teaching of the Lord Jesus that when he comes, he'll sit on his throne and all nations will be gathered before him and God will separate those who believe from those who don't believe. And those who believe will enter into a time of blessing. Those who don't believe will enter into a time of eternal punishment and woe. God makes a distinction when he judges. And God is going to judge. He's going to come and he's going to put all things right. He's going to settle accounts. He's going to examine our lives. He'll expose our sins and our secrets. And he will eliminate the guilty. What can we do? Well, seek God. Repent. Ask him for mercy. Seek his righteousness and to do so in humility. So it's a very strong message of coming judgment and total annihilation. But at the end of it, Zephaniah ends on this remarkable description of the ultimate future. He's looked within and then said what we can do. He's looked around and then back at Jerusalem and said it's all over. But it's not the complete end. Chapter 3 verses 9 to 20 has this wonderful description of what lies ahead. So it's look within, look around, now it's look beyond, look way ahead, what's coming. And the New Testament encourages us to do exactly the same. Verse 9 talks about international godliness. The nations are going to come to faith. Then I will purify the lips of the peoples, the nations, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. A time in the future will come when all nations will be pure in God's sight and will worship him, serve him, call on him. Everybody. This is the new world. If it's not the millennium, then it's the new age, the new heaven and the new earth. And God talks about this wonderful description that the fire that... <clears throat> came to consume is also the fire that will purify. Um, while God will destroy the wicked nations, he will also transform us into a new nation, into one family, into one people of God. In verse 12, the Lord says, um, But I will leave within you the meek and the humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouth. Um, they will eat and lie down and no one will make them afraid. A time of future security, of us being transformed by grace and by forgiveness of God's work in our life. Zephaniah is looking ahead and seeing that. He's talking about the impact of the gospel. Verse 15, the Lord has taken away your punishment. Uh, 
The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, verse 17, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but he will rejoice over you with singing. It's a remarkable verse that God will be not only with us and in our midst, that he will be our God and we'll be his people, but he will delight in us. And in fact, he will rejoice over us with singing. God will be singing for joy about us, his bride. And then in verse 20, he finishes with this, again, a wonderful promise of God is going to gather all of the believers together. He's going to restore and he's going to honour them. This is the future kingdom age. Look beyond towards the end. God is in ultimate control. Regardless of what you think is going on in the world today, God will have his way. And Zephaniah fits into that picture of um, God's people had, in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 8, 9 and 10, the the glory of the Lord had risen from over the temple and had gone to the threshold and had moved to the gates of the temple and then to the gates of the city and then had left. God had left Jerusalem. Well, in Zephaniah, in this last bit, it's God is going to be returning. And when he returns, he will judge the nations and he'll restore his people as one on a new heaven and on a new earth. Zephaniah speaks of this God of judgment as well as this God of mercy, anticipating, as I said, the gospel. And so we have a choice. Which one will you choose? To ignore God is to choose his justice. What we need to do is to come to God and to repent and to ask him for mercy. And only bad people do that. Only people willing to acknowledge that they're not right. And let me finish by simply saying this. In heaven, in this new age, when God the King will be in our midst, when Jesus will reign from the city of Jerusalem, that heaven will be a multinational, multiracial um, gathering of people who are one family. And then we will all be colorblind, not literally, but relationally. Then there'll be no more discrimination and abuse. And then we will dwell in peace. And that's what the church is to be now. That we are to be a picture of that coming day, an example to the nations. So it's a wonderful book and I commend it to you and ask, encourage you to read it a couple of times through and ask God to speak to you. It contains some great truths. And let me finish by saying Zephaniah's name means hidden by God. And I think what it means is his mother hid him during the reign of King Manasseh. When Manasseh was gathering up all the royal princes and offering them as infants and burning them to the god Molech. But Zephaniah's mum took him hid him for a future time of ministry just like Moses's mother hid him so Zephaniah's mum hid him hence his name Zephaniah the hidden one hidden by God for God so too for us God has been overseeing our life and he wants to use us for his purposes let's submit to him and make ourselves available to him let's pray together Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this book of Zephaniah, uh, a book that many of us probably haven't read that much, but it contains a great message that you're a God of justice, a God of truth and of right, and that you're going to put things right. And Lord, we trust in that and rejoice in it. And we are grieved, like you are, at many of the um, injustices and cruelties and bad things that it happening right now in our world and people seem to be getting away with it but you will call them to account so lord we look to you we seek your face we ask you to be merciful to us that you would strengthen us and help us to walk in the right way to be righteous and to do so humbly to be available for you to use us in any way you see fit just like you use Zephaniah so lord here we are Fill us with your spirit and use us. For Jesus' sake, we pray. Amen. Jesus.
Let's just close the service in hearing Ephesians 3 verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God bless one and all. Have a great week. Thank you.